good morning good evening and good morning to some who are attending from other part of the world welcome to this bombay management associations master class today we have with us <coughs> professor yu munro for this master class who will be speaking on refresh renew refocus in the changing environment this bma master class is brought to you in collaboration with kohinoor business school and i have pleasure to invite professor dr n m konda to give his remarks i welcome dr m n n m konda sir and take this opportunity to introduce him to you all dr konda is currently director general at kohinoor business school he is also independent director on the board of global education limited nagpur he comes with an industry experience of 25 years and has worked with abb voltas etc in different capacities he was awarded professor dharani sinha memorial award for excellence in management education instituted by dr p n singh foundation in 2008 dr konda was conferred lifetime achievement award by dm dna and stars of the industry group for innovative b school award on in 2009 and many more dr konda is also our past president and i thank him for collaborating with bma for this educative series of master class i had good fortune to work under his leadership in nmims and uh, uh, i am very happy today to welcome him to give his initial welcome remarks and welcome professor munro for this bma master class in collaboration with kohinoor business school over to you sir yeah thanks uh, dr kavita lagate for a good in introduction especially in the evening when we are talking about uh, my colleague professor huge <laughs> and past presidents my and other dignitaries invited faculty and students raf mas has said rest where you are weary refresh and renew yourself your body your mind your spirit and when you want to get back i think that's what the theme of the workshop we are talking about when we look at this uh, last 18 months the business the institutions focused on areas like secure business protect institutions protect employees survival face the complexities and move from unknown to unknown to unknown that that's a very key area that was moving around well these are the realities of life and when we talk realities of life the time has come for us to refresh ourselves and how do we refresh ourselves we refresh ourselves by taking a break of continuity of the past what we have done in the past 18 18 months take a break refresh yourself and once you refresh yourself understand the implications of decisions and actions taken by the organization in terms of the employees in terms of the customers in terms of the stakeholders and one should take a relook at it re refresh at it the challenge for us is refocus and when we talk of refocus well refocus is going to give us a new opportunities and most important thing which i've been coming across is the new refocus focuses on distributed form of leadership a leadership which is going to make a difference to the organizations is not just the leadership that we are talking about the new dimensions that are coming in for future are encourage experimentation remain sensitive to the pattern that emerge as a result listen to the client for the most opportunities prepare for the future skills and importantly taking people people centric approach 
change the policy towards employees because the new concept of work from home plus work from office are going to make difference. And one of the areas that has come in terms of the refocus is focus on the resilience, trust, empathy. Though these terms were being used in the past, but now we find that these terms and terminologies are being used on a regular basis. And the question I'm sure we'll have some answers from my colleague, Professor Huge. He will definitely reply on these points because that's one area which is bothering me. Does it mean that there was no trust? Does it mean that there's no resilience? But why we are talking about these terms? And the last element that we're talking about is under renew. When we say renew, understand the implications of refocus and how it is going to help the organization and how it is going to help the employees and most importantly, how it is going to decide the strategy and the priority. The key areas for success during this shift will require to concentrate on societal, organizational team and individual employee level. So this is where the renewal renew is going to take place. And once we talk about renewal, obviously there are a number of areas that we can learn from today's interactive session. Madam, I do not want to take much of a time. I would now like to, back, I, I would request you to take back my mic, though I cannot hear the mic, but definitely. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I am very happy to introduce to you today for today's VMA Masterclass, the chairperson, uh, Shri R. Ramakrishnan. With great pleasure, I'm introducing Mr. R. Ramakrishnan to everyone present here today. Mr. Ramakrishnan is a chairman and managing partner of Transform Formia Adv Advisors. He is a former vice chairman of JMD and group CEO of Polycap Wires. Between 1982 to 1999, while working with Asian Paints, with his hard work and dedication, the company grew in size from rupees 60 crores to rupees 1200 crores. Mr. Ramakrishnan has done his PhD in internationalization of Indian companies, impact of organizational factors from NM College and post-graduation from XLRI Jamshedpur. He is also our past president of BMA and is actively involved and always ready to guide us in our projects. I am very happy to welcome you, sir, and request you to set the tone for this BMA masterclass with you, Munro, today. Over to you. Thank you, President Kavita Lagate, Professor Munro, Dr. Konda, Professor Mani. It's a pleasure and joy being here today. But I do feel a little bit like Arjuna in the beginning of the Mahabharata battle, when the master, Lord Krishna, was going to teach him the Bhagavad Gita, if someone asked Arjuna who wanted to learn the Bhagavad Gita to comment on the Bhagavad Gita, I feel in that kind of a precarious position. Uh, Professor Munro, I take strength from the fact that we have a few things in common, whether it be new product development, whether it be internationalization of businesses or it be scaling up of small and medium scale companies, uh, subjects that you teach and, suspect, and subjects that I have actually worked hands on. So without much ado, when we look back at the last 18 months, clearly many of us are grateful that we have so far navigated the COVID times successfully. So we have a sense of gratitude that we have made it through. At the same time, a profound sense of sadness for those who haven't. But there is a little bit of a relief that hopefully soon it'll get over. 2021 friends will hold and 22 substantially new challenges. There are apprehensions about the vaccine rollout. There are apprehensions about the new variants that are coming in. But no matter what, there will be a huge economic rebound. There will be a huge consumption rebound. There will be a huge tourism rebound. 
there will be a huge rebound in terms of people starting to enjoy life a lot more uh, given the fact that we have been caged over the last 18 months. Very often people have felt depleted, physically tired, mentally fatigued, emotionally spent, and probably still somewhere spiritually holding on. But resilience isn't what you have. Resilience is what you do. What are those very small daily rituals? How do you reach out to others? How do you spread within this catastrophe a few smiles? How do you wipe away a few tears? Ultimately, how do you respond as a human being to the pandemic and make a difference to the lives of the others? These small things have a disproportionate impact on your own well-being and that of others. What matters most is not problems themselves, but how have you responded to those problems? I would just like to say that vision is equal to power in this kind of a VUCA environment. If you have the vision, if you know that there is light at the end of the tunnel, though it is a little dark right now, it is that light at the end of the tunnel that you can visualize and spread to everyone else that will enable you to lead your teams, your family, your friends beyond the situation in which they find themselves today. Based on my own experience, uh, Professor Munro, uh, I think there are five things that leaders can possibly use to refresh, renew, and refocus. The number one is humility. There are so many uncertainties. It's absolutely important to ask for help when facing challenges. No shoulders are broad enough. No chest is broad enough to be able to absorb the challenges that the environment is posing and constantly changing. The second important aspect is focus. Be focused on the main thing. Energize your team to focus on the main thing. Then at an appropriate time, delegate, move on to the next main thing so that by the time your team masters the challenges of today, you're preparing them to face the consequences of tomorrow. The third important aspect is empathy. Somewhere as leaders, it is imperative for us to reach out, communicate to people who are suffering. Someone whose wife is in hospital. Someone whose 32-year-old sister, and I'm sorry to say, uh, all of us, uh, all of us know that one of our uh, very esteemed uh, uh, people uh, has very recently lost his own sister to this terrible pandemic. Dr. Ranjan Banerjee, who was heading SPJN, he lost his own sister, a brilliant professor, uh, very young, an outstanding professor at IIT Bombay. He lost her to COVID. It's such a shocking piece of news. He's from our fraternity and, and he lost his sister. So reaching out with empathy, connecting with people whom you have otherwise not bothered to connect with, it's even more important in today's time. Stay physically and spiritually fit. The fitter you are mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, you will be able to spread the light of that well-being and your personal wellness will result in your team's personal wellness, will result in your organizational personal wellness. And finally, invest in your own development. Work from home doesn't mean not working. You can invest in your own development, invest in training, invest in reskilling, picking up new hobbies, so that when we emerge out of this pandemic, we all emerge much stronger. Professor Munro, we are all great friends of Canada. I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau when he had come to Bombay last. I was fascinated by his socks. And now I am sure we are all going to be equally fascinated with your lecture. Thank you so very much. We are looking forward to this masterclass. Thank you so much. Sir.
thank you thank you sir and uh, very well said the empathy and keeping the spirituality and mental balance in this testing uh, times is what is the key for coming over of this pandemic situation thank you thank you for those words and uh, now i will i will introduce uh, mm -hmm. professor manro professor you dr you manro is currently a part of design consultant with capacity in the canada's capacity by design program as well as a faculty member in capacity canada's B, uh, board governance boot camp through his work he helps social good agencies develop better ways of dealing with complex issues such as food security social equity housing shortages and support for individual with expect the exceptionalities in addition to the above roles you is actively engaged with the business community through his consulting and management development activities some of the organizations that professor you has worked with include lenamar steelcraft bruce par bank of montreal ontario hydro astrazeneca society of management consultants of ontario buyer volkswagen and electro home he and two other colleagues are currently developing a course focused on helping senior leaders deal with the disruption and transformation professor manro recently retired from whitfield uriel school of business and economics where he served as mba director as well as professor of marketing and international business he was at loria for over 35 years and has taught a variety of marketing and strategy courses and has held numerous administrative positions including associate dean of business and director of the loreal trade development center he continues to teach as visiting professor in france and india he is also currently ser serving as marketing director for the kitchener blues festival professor manro we are very happy to have you at this bma master class which is a activity which bma has very recently taken up there are over 300 students and the members of bombay management association attending this uh, the session thank you for accepting our invitation and over to you for your presentation professor manro thank you thank you for the bombay management association and for the corner business school for uh, inviting me to have this uh, opportunity to share what uh, little i can uh, about uh, what we've been through and are going through and um, i want to share my screen my internet is back and forth so if there becomes a problem let me know um, i'm just going to get this up hopefully there we go um, there was there was a lot of very useful comments made by both dr condup and um, the the uh, uh, the last speaker and i think it's we've got to listen to those words and um, i think reflect and you know while the title of what my my talk is today is about refresh renew and refocus i really think it's a it's a good time for us to think about Uh, the lessons we should learn from the covid pandemic and also um what we've what we've actually gone through and and um the takeaways it's been a a catastrophic event that as uh, as previously mentioned it's taken a lot of lives and and there's a lot of sadness and uh disruption in a negative way but there's been some really uh positive things that have come out of this that we want to make sure we absorb and institutionalize in our uh behavior and thinking going forward so i i i'd like to focus not on the focus today a little bit on some lessons that we can take away from this and uh, use most certainly when we're dealing with with move my screen here now so my screen for 
Yeah, it's visible. Very good. The first slide is visible. Say about this is this is one event that, and I think it reflect reflects the connectedness of of all of us um, when we have something that occurs in one part of the world and actually ends up uh, affecting everybody uh, throughout the world. And so this is a this is something we all and. You know, my experience in, in Canada is different than the experience in the U.S. And it's obviously to be different than what uh, you are experiencing and have experienced in India and, and China and Europe and in all parts of the world. So I can't speak directly for what's going on. I don't want to speak directly for what's going on in India. You know that better than me. Um, having been to India a number of times, I can only imagine uh, what it was like you know that better but the more important thing for us is is to is to to know that all of us have gone through a pretty disruptive event that um there are some really important lessons for us to learn and some of those lessons you've already heard from in the introductory uh comments that were made but i just want to make sure that we, we sort of keep that in mind this is this is a, a globally shared um experience it's really slow to move <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get to the next screen there we go um and maybe talib wouldn't call it a black swan but <clears throat> it was a, it was a pretty unexpected event that had significant negative consequences and uh, that's usually what you refer to as a as sort of black swan and something that was not predictable and maybe there's debates around uh, how predictable it could have been let's not worry about that for the moment this is, it was a catastrophic catastrophic event um, that had really big negative consequences for lots of people around the world <laughs> i never want to lose sight of that and i don't want you to lose sight of that so um, but these events come along right and we're going to have to figure out um, how to deal with them. And I think that's where the lesson, uh, the takeaway for us is. The pandemic also amplified existing trends and, and I'll get into this in a moment, but there were a lot of trends that were impacting businesses, society and governments as prior to the pandemic. And the pandemic actually sort of what I think about amplified and accelerated um, some of these trends and uh, that's, that's an important thing to keep in mind as well. This is really slow to move. Um, I'm trying to get my screen. There we go. <clears throat> so some of the ones, um, it keeps on telling my internet connection is unstable and I apologize for that. But um, the, the, some of the trends and there's some work done by, by um, Pricewaterhouse Coopers and their strategy and business side of things, where we looked at um, the asymmetry, and this is the disparity of wealth in the world, right? The, is that my thing making noise or somebody else? Doesn't matter. Um, so this is the symmetry area where we have challenges between. Uh, the wealthier getting wealthy, the wealthy getting wealthier, and and the have not really. Suffered. This is something that was uh, amplified in, uh, in during COVID, and it's it's reflecting on a, a sort of a challenge for us when we start to think about uh, the social fabric of of uh, of economies. And in my you know in the introduction of where I in my work. And the things that I'm working on, I have, I myself have transformed my focus from a for-profit context to a not-for-profit social good context. And I'm doing a lot of work in that area right now. So my my lens tends to be through through that more than the business. So I keep my foot um, in touch with uh, the business side of things as well, the for-profit side of things for a while. The other thing is we were being disrupted prior to COVID and COVID has accelerated the disruption. So let's, 
and I'm, one of my comments, and I'll make a statement at the end, is that, that disruption is going to be a part of our lives. And one of the things that we're going to have to learn is to understand it and be able to deal with disruption. In many cases, actually drive our own disruption. So that's that's another trend that was out there. And I'll speak to that a little later on. We've got dem demography also playing a factor. And we saw this, uh, you can see this is a differential effect. Economies that have a, a strong, a lot, a lot of younger people will have different types of challenges. But people who have a lot of uh, seniors, uh, older people will experience different types of pressures. And we saw this in our particular economy. Uh, we have a large number of older people that um, suffered uh, significantly with, with COVID. Uh, but the challenge we were facing as a, as a, as a society in, in, in Canada was uh, we had to, um, this was tasking our economy to begin with COVID. What COVID did is accentuated, right? And that's the, my point I'm trying to make is this, this notion about, about amplifying the effects of, of trends that were transforming our economies beforehand and our societies. Polarization, there's, you know, uh, just prior to COVID, there was this notion about, um, and I'm a big believer in globalization, but there was a movement in the sort of a counter direction with some localization, right? And uh, there was pressures domestically from, from, uh, from uh, consumers and employees and saying, how do we keep jobs in our country? How do we keep our economy going in here at the same time be a, an important player globally? So there was a, a sort of almost a counter movement to, to globalization where people were focusing on nationalization. One of the positive things that came out of, of, uh, of this was the um, international collaboration to develop a vaccine. I don't know about you, but when COVID hit uh, and they were talking about the timeline to develop a state vaccine that we could benefit from, um, it was going to be a year plus. It could be 16 to 18 months. And they were able to accelerate that development process to get us um, workable vaccines to help us deal with this catastrophic uh, pandemic. And um, I think that was a good example of when countries want to work together and companies want to collaborate, we can do things quicker. I know technology had something to do with it as well. Artificial intelligence was, was a factor. And with economies and uh, governments threw a lot of money at this to accelerate it, but we needed the knowledge to share to be able to make this happen. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a sort of notion about trust in, um, in institutions as well that was starting to be challenged. And um, with social media, the ability for um, the individuals to have uh, power um, and knowledge uh, and be informed and um, question the kinds of decisions and communications that were coming from um, uh, governments and uh, other important influential uh, institutions, that um, there, was a, there was a sort of a, a, a dwindling of the trust in those institutions. So, so all of these things, uh, don't want to belabor them, were kind of amplified uh, with, with the pandemic. The pandemic also magnified gaps in our, uh, in our systems. And uh, we saw it with respect to supply chains, uh, the ability for countries to get product, much needed product, um, whether it be for uh, personal health protection product or just product to get uh, uh, things done. The global supply chains were taxed and uh, in terms of the surge in demand for certain types of products and the ability to uh, fulfill the demand for those products uh, um, quick enough. And so uh, we recognize that the global supply chains are things that, that companies and organizations and, and uh, um, governments are looking at shortening those supply chains and looking at alternate 
uh, backup systems and, and um, we see this in, um, in, uh, in our own kind of environment where a lot of our uh, manufacturing has gone offshore. Uh, there is a movement of back into uh, to our uh, to our own economy and strategic areas that matter going forward. So, uh, there's a lot of rethinking of supply. Similar task to uh, uh, a level. We can have system of um, uh, attention forward. The deficiencies were were uh, were magnified, and um, I think attention will be sp spent there going forward. Business models, obviously, were those that were ready to pivot uh, and had already started to pivot towards an online virtual kind of exchange with consumers were more ready uh, to to uh, to do that. Others that uh, maybe whose businesses didn't lend itself to that or were reluctant or slower to adopt uh, had to quickly adjust their business service models uh, because of the pandemic when we can't have people interfacing directly with people we have to think about alternate ways of doing commerce the organizations that i was working with in the social goods sector very face a very human interaction type of of uh, um, business model for them had to uh, pivot quickly uh, uh, to, to a much more virtual and individual uh, care model. And um, I was actually very impressed with their ability under, under duress, under um, uh, lots of pressure and demand. Um, one of the things we also learn is our social sector is, uh, is another area where uh, we needed uh, a lot more attention being paid. And I think going forward, our social support systems, those important things and the important elements of, of, a, of a, a society are gonna need a lot more attention going forward. Um, and the weaknesses in the systems were amplified and magnified uh, and are now front and center. And mental health, some of the introductory comments we're speaking to that and getting at that, uh, our own mental health, but the mental health of our society and people in our society um, is going to be an interesting uh, challenge for, for the systems to deal with. Um, governments. Governments also had to pivot and think about their role and how they had to respond um, and make up for some of these deficiencies that were uh, occurring in their economies. And that's usually the role that government Governments focus on gaps in, in um, where, where businesses can't address and society is not able to address things. Um, yet uh, they had to pivot as well and they had to think about how they were going to work um, to ensure that the, their populace was safe and healthy and uh, had to get through this in uh, different communication styles, um, different collaboration initiatives. Um, all kinds of uh, shifts in the way government behaved were required to get through through the pandemic. There are other lessons that we can learn from this as well. And I think you talked about this already. And, and I think I love the notion about this resilience. And I think it's only, uh, it's human nature that when necessary and put in a crisis situation we will respond it's just it's just human nature we have to respond and it's our resilience and our ability to respond and um i mean there was some you know obviously some some uh behavior that you wouldn't want to replicate it and and uh, and you know going forward but there was a lot of sort of human nature uh, humanistic kind of behavior that that manifests during the pandemic um, that uh, served us well to deal with a crisis and 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 people do this and and I think it's uh, we should never lose sight of the fact that um, it's it's possible everything is possible uh, and human human nature will will make it happen if it needs to happen so we're pretty resilient. Uh, 
uh, it, as individuals, we're very resilient. And I think this is something we really want to, to, um, to continue to be. And I think that's one of the lessons we could take from through. The other thing I found is uh, that the ability to change, um, and I always call about inertia, there's always inertia out there that gets in the way of change, right? And for, whether it be for businesses, for individuals or governments or whatever, there's a lot of inertia just because we get comfortable with the way we do things, um, we institutionalize that way of doing things, and we have uh, very strong inertia uh, around things that we think are good and they're working. But when something comes along and requires us to change, it, we need to unfreeze that. And one thing the pandemic did is, is that crisis uh, put us into change mode. And there were a lot of things that changed very rapidly that would have taken a lot longer to occur uh, in, in, a, in a traditional non-crisis way. So I think it's really important we, we, we pick up on that aspect as well. There's a lot, and there's lots to learn from those changes that we've gone through. So what need to different and this is kind of where where I want us to think about is you know disruption will be a part of our lives and we need to understand it and prepare for it. Um, we, we always we can't always anticipate the exact nature of it, but we should know and learn from even the pandemic that that's amplified the trends that were raised that were already creating disruption things can happen faster than we might have uh, anticipated. So I think we need to be better prepared as individuals, as organizations, and as society in terms of dealing with disruption. And for businesses, uh, I think we need to be more future ready. And um, you know, the, the time horizon the, the prior to this, the notion was is that we can hardly strategic plan because anytime we put a plan together, it usually is anchored to some assumptions about the future and the future is changing so rapidly that we have to be a very uh, agile and and kind of uh, adaptive organization so but we need to be more future ready in terms of not just for tomorrow but for what's out there down the line and coming down the lines so we need to understand the forces and the pattern of disruption in our environments. Uh, we need to be comfortable developing different scenarios of what the future might look like. And then backcasting is something I'll talk just very briefly about, but uh, backcasting to, to today to think about if we anticipate a certain type of future uh, occurring, then what do we need to do today to start to prepare for that and move forward? We make bets, um, we, we make investments, uh, and the timing of those are really kind of the things that we need to do to be able to prepare for that. And then we've got, I had developed as the introductory comments um, were uh, eloquently shared, uh, this notion of agility and resilience as a culture and as an organization, we need to think what that means to us. So there's, there's, the good thing is there's lots of, um, and there seems to be more, I'm noticing more, in tags, thinking about the future, how businesses prepare for that. And there's a Future Today Institute, and I've left the uh, for that there. And there's some really interesting work that's in New York. There's a really interesting work being done there in terms of uh, what do organizations need to do. And they've got a series of questions that they talk about. You know, what are plausible, deep, 20 plus years, long range, 10 plus years, and near term, two plus year futures? And, you know, what scenarios describe you, you'll see that they have ways of uh, making us uh, more comfortable, but also better at anticipating and creating uh, visions of the future. So, so these are just some of the kinds that they, they, they talk about. You know, we, how do we build an early warning system to see the next disruptive event? And they've got models that help us through this kind of thing. So I'll share one of the things. The Deloitte's done a lot of work in terms of um, talking about these mega trends that are gonna shape uh, the future for all of us. Um, and so they've got a whole big list of, of, of uh, uh, changes on the political, economic, social, technological, uh, 
the environmental side of things that intersect, collide, and you know, catalyze, work together to create megatrends that are going to affect all of us. And so we don't always have to, you know, um, do all of this hard, heavy lifting work ourselves. We can actually uh, look at uh, what others are doing. We're spending a lot more time and energy on this and think about what does it really mean for us? Um, and so they've got all kinds of mega tr tr uh, trends. They've got 12 potentially economically disruptive technologies that are going to come our way. I personally think one of the ones that's going to be the next big force for us will be um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, machine thinking. Uh, all of those kinds of developments there have a potential uh, to significantly disrupt in both a positive and potentially negative way, uh, the way we operate um, as businesses, but also the way we, uh, the way society and governments uh, operate as well. So I'm not going through these kinds of things, but what they've also do is talk about how these mega trends are going to impact um, uh, businesses, uh, society, governments, um, and they talk about uh, how each one of these and where they're at in terms of whether it's a primary, secondary, or other kind of impact. And so um, you don't have to take this as the, 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 the definitive view on this, but it's a good starting point for you to reflect if you're in a business or thinking about things, to a career or whatever, wherever stage of life you're at, to think about what that might mean for you. The future today, Institute really talks about uh, these 11 disruptive forces. And I really like this because it's a, it's, it's a little bit more macro in, in, uh, in perspective. And they look at your organization and then they say through the lens of, of one particular technology, and you can run through all these different types of technologies. And they've done some really interesting work looking at the impact of artificial intelligence as an example. Um, they think it's a pretty profound uh, disruptive force that's, that's uh, here and will continue to be here. But they would then look at that in terms of how does that manifest and, and, and what are the implications then for things like wealth distribution that we talked about, media and telecommunications, the environment, demography, public health, the economy, geopo uh, geopolitics, government, infrastructure, all of, all of those, education, where a lot of you are right today, it's you think about of what the implications of that are. Uh, and these areas are also contributing to uh, uh, contributing forces of change and being like. And so I think this, this is another kind of in a frame that try to set there and, and um, where they might have uh, uh, implications for us, depending on whether we're a government or whatever. There's all, of these changes, right? And sort of timing and impact, right? And, and, and I think we need to think about are these uh, uh, accelerating to the stage where, and they're having a significant impact on, on us, our organization or our society or our government, whatever lens you're using. And it could affect things like government support, funding cycles, social movements, all of those kinds of things are contributing to, to these forces. And I was reading a piece the other day, I was just talking about battery technology. And uh, one of the companies that I was doing some work with, Linamar, is a uh, automotive supplier um, to the major OEMs. Um, they have about 60 plants around the world. They're a Canadian company. And the issue we've talked about is uh, for them, uh, a big chunk of their business has been with combustion engines. And what they have to think about is what's the shift towards uh, electric vehicles and what, what implications does that mean for them? And uh, it was interesting, you know, electric vehicles at the time we were having these kind of strategic conversations was, uh, they were already placing bets in that and working with folks like Volkswagen and, and Mercedes and other people on these kinds of uh, uh, new initiatives. But the notion was how quickly will uh, electric vehicles displace the combustion engine? And 
I was reading a piece the other day that talks about, you know, you can think about infrastructure, you can think about the battery technology itself as being an important technological development as a, as a, as a, that could accelerate that. And uh, somebody's invented, a uh, former Tesla employee actually has invented a battery that um, lasts a lot longer uh, and it doesn't need to be recharged as much and has a significant amount of power. And, and uh, so we've seen all kinds of potential there for that to accelerate something that's happening a lot faster than a lot of the majors in the automotive sector really uh, felt was going to. Uh, I would say some of the North American manufacturers were pretty slow to respond to the electric vehicle. They were saying that American consumers are going to still want uh, cars, uh, fast cars and big cars and trucks and those kinds of things. And the electric vehicles haven't been able to fulfill the needs in those product categories yet, but uh, lo and behold, they have, they're moving quickly there. So all I'm saying is there's, there's breakthroughs that can accelerate um, the, the nature of the change, particularly if we are looking at things like technology. And we saw that with the pandemic uh, coming up with vaccines. So, so one of the things that they talk about organization being future ready is, is one of the, the, the challenges we have is that we tend not to look far enough we tend to look at more of the probable types of futures that are, that are gonna manifest. And so we get the po probable, plausible, and possible. And the further out you go, the harder it is because you have less uh, specific data in which to rely on, but you need different types of models and different types of thinking. And, and the future stage is really, uh, the folks that are working in this area are helping us uh, look at it in an ecosystem kind of way and look at more macro interrelated types of, of, of changes. So, so there's help out there. And I mentioned this notion about backcasting and, you know, we, we forecast, we we're comfortable with forecasting. I think the movement we're going to have to make is, is be more comfortable creating scenarios and then being able to backcast from those scenarios to, to, to what we need to do to prepare for those different kinds of futures. And there's many different types of, of futures, you know, there's the, and we have to be, we have to be prepared to put a spec to what we envision as well, right? It's not always uh, what we want to have happen. Uh, we need to be thinking about what's possible, what's plausible, what's probable. Um, we also like to think about what's preferable, you know, and what do we need to do to move towards a more preferable future? So, so we got to get better at this is the basic message in here. There's different scenario arc uh, archetypes that actually help us. Um, I won't need to get into all of these. I'm just a little cognizant of time. Um, but this backcasting is an interesting kind of notion is that we can create a vision for the future. We backcast to, to, to today and think about what do we need to start to do today to prepare for that future vision that we're aspiring to, to attain. Uh, or, or that future vision that we uh, uh, view as being a probable scenario for what we're going to have to deal with. You know, it is, it, it, does it move us in the right direction? It, how flexible are we? Um, is it going to be something that's going to be a, a, a profitable kind of venture for us? So what this is really getting at is we need to be a, do a better job of decoding the future, right? Trying to understand what the future is all about. And as I said, the Future Today Institute has actually developed a, a, a simulation game. It's a very rudimentary, it's not a high tech simulation game, but it's got cards and uh, it, it really allows us to practice uh, looking at stakeholders, technology and situations. So they'll go like something like this. They'll take a card that talks about a stakeholder, a particular technology and a particular situation where that te technology and that stakeholder will be at play. And these cards, from these cards, we create scenarios. And then we ask ourselves from these scenarios, you know, what have we discovered? Uh, you know, what's, what excites us? What challenges do we see? What opportunities do we see? What disruptions can we see with these things? Um, what do we need to do as an organization to prepare for these things? And so the practice here, and so we can practice getting good at creating future scenarios, but also being able to think about what they mean for us and decoding what we need to be doing about that future now, not when it happens and it's too late. 
I can't see my slide here for some reason. So, um, oh yeah, the another way to think about this as well is is um, a lot of incumbents have been disrupted by new players coming into their into their industry, right, and their sector, and they've. Uh, the incumbents have been, uh, you know, people that have been established in, in a particular uh, sector get very comfortable with the players, right? They know the players, they know they, who they have to compete with, and the, the, the sort of competitive dynamics are, are, are they're more comfortable with that because they know them. They know the players, they know themselves, they know what they're doing, they get comfortable doing that. Where disruption gets really problematic for these companies is when somebody that's not encumbered by convention and all of that inertia, that good inertia that exists in, in the in the sector, comes from an outside with a very different mis, uh, business model and disrupts them. And you're seeing that in every particular industry where you have new players with new ideas, uh, better ways of doing things, new business models coming in and disrupting. So you can think about as a disruptor, you can take that perspective, but also those are being disrupted. How are you going to have to respond going forward? And so we need to understand the different patterns of disruption and uh, Deloitte uh, University is, uh, they have their own kind of university group there with Deloitte has talked about these nine patterns of disruption that either uh, speak to how the uh, value price equation is being transformed or really look at how they're gonna harness network effects, right? And so we're starting to understand the different disruption models that exist out there and who's best able to pursue which type of model so that's starting to emerge so once again not being prescriptive about this but there are ideas around if we are wanting to disrupt a particular mar market or respond to a disruption what other different ways we could do that um, which ways make sense for give, given our position in an industry if we're in a, a second and so we can start to think about how do we harness network effects that that makes sense for and people talk about platforms and uh, distributed product management network effects or how can we transform the the value price equation in our place by challenging some of the assumptions uh, and and being very innovative a lot of this has to do uh, with being a lot more innovative as as organization as companies so so what I'm saying is there's ways of doing this. And then they talk about, they go through about, there really be a thing for disruption and should look at being an infrastructure provider, a platform organizer or a trusted advisor uh, versus the product avenue. And that's one of the notions that they have. And then they, got, they go through and talk about what that means. And we don't have the time to get into it, but I'll share my slides with you so you can look at this and you can go to Deloitte directly to see some of the things that they are, uh, are looking at. The whole concept of platforms is really a, an interesting uh, uh, way of thinking. So rather than thinking about, you know, we have products and services, you step back and say, what are the kinds of assets and capabilities that will allow us a platform as a basis for competition? And that's where a lot of, you know, the Amazons of the world have a platform that they're leveraging in terms of, of uh, commerce, right? Um, social media is another form of a platform. And so incumbents can think about what is it that we do? We already have relationships with customers, but how can we transform our thinking and our competitive stance from one of a product service to a platform, right? And so, what we're getting at in here is that organizations are not only going to have to be able to, and people and leaders are going to not only have to be better at reading and understanding the forces of disruption, being better and at understanding uh, what possible future scenarios might emerge, and also being able to transform the organizations that they run, the institutions that they run. And to do that, you know, we're going to have to obviously have awareness. We're going to have to kind of be able to make choices and focus our efforts. We're going to learn, refine, and monitor and get better at this. And so lots of uh, strategy, right? This is, this is, you know, making, having strategic notions and ideas about where we are and why, but 
also being able to transform who we are to be able to get there. And I think uh, it's no longer a tweaking of our organization. Sometimes we have to do a complete rebuild and transform. So it's a major, major change. And as I said at the beginning, when it's necessary, we're pretty good at changing quickly. When you need to do that in a more kind of evolutionary, gradual kind of way, it's harder to orchestrate. And I think leaders are going to have to get better at doing this. There's a notion about future organization. Um, McKinsey talked about in a, in a recent paper, talked about that on, from three different perspectives. And it was like, there's the who we are, and there's a there's an emerging stronger sense of purpose that's that's out there in terms of why do we exist what value what value do we provide and, and where do we fit so who are we how we operate right and and the notion is uh, uh, quicker uh, having more uh, agile kind of uh, uh, talent right diversity of talent but also flatten the structures to be able to move quicker. And how we grow is, you know, from platforms to ecosystems and obviously learning. So there's some interesting guidelines for here for us in terms of what do we need to look like to be a future ready organization. Governments are also going to have to come out of this and have to rethink some of the uh, infrastructure realignment that need in their in their economies. Uh, there's going to be a huge economic burden from the stimulus spending that that uh, is going to be need to be. Uh, uh, looked at, they also may be much more future oriented, right? And so their, the relationships they have with other countries will be, uh, they're going to face pressures there in terms of um, uh, the internationalization of their, of their countries, uh, as well as the pressures to, to shore up the national uh, capabilities to make sure that uh, we take care of the home front. And at the same time, we have a relevant play in the in the uh, international scheme of things. So we need governance, agility, and real resilience. And I, uh, governments typically are not known for that. Individuals, I think there's some really, really powerful uh, comments made at the beginning about, about us as individuals, our own personal development, our recalibration of, and I'm seeing this in terms of what's important to us, the work-life balance um, is being cal calibrated and, and um, the future of work itself. Um, if you think about carrying that through, said so we've learned to work from home. Um, and uh, what does that do to the nature of work and, and uh, where we work and all those office buildings we have? So we need the as well. And, and at, at, there's a sense of community that's emerged that we don't want to lose sight of it. So, Mike, my, my, I'm going to end there and hopefully we have for, for some questions. but. I went through a lot of things fast, but I think the pandemic, while catastrophic on a lot of fronts, offers us many valuable lessons uh, for us as business and society and governments. And I think we're going to be tested a lot more ahead. So the better we are at being able to deal with this, the better prepared we'll be for these disruptions. We may be a disruptor ourselves in terms of some of the things we work on. And, and um, disruption doesn't have to be a bad a bad thing disruption can be a very good thing right and and uh, we can keep that in mind there's lots of sources out there to help us with these disruptions and i'm a glass half full kind of individual so i like to harness the positive aspects of this and embed those in our future fabric going forward right there's a lot of very positive things that we can take away from what we've just gone through and that's not to undermine the, the catastrophic and huge loss of life that was, uh, you know, which is really, really, really unfortunate. And uh, uh, it was it occurred around the world, right? So no one was spared from that. But but there was some really positive kinds of things that emerged here as well. And I think we want to harness those and and uh, help build those into the way we think and who we are and how we act, uh, and it will make us better. Uh, prepared for what's ahead. Let me leave it there and maybe I can try to answer some questions. Dr. Monroe. We're still, we're still there? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry good, about that. Good morning, good morning. I, I, my name is Dr. Vigyan Verma. Uh, I am uh, going with the 
moderate the uh, last part of this session as such. I just would like to acknowledge on, on part of, uh, on behalf of all the attendees today is it's an absolutely excellent top class presentation and the kind of cover which you made is absolutely unbelievable. In fact, uh, one of those uh, fair, uh, what do you call rare uh, presentations which we have attended so far, wherein we got to know so many things uh, uh, from a very knowledgeable person like you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Munro. But just wanted to give, a, 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 you know, for, you know, just when the pandemic hit us last year, and we went into mm -hmm. town in the month of March 2020, I was very curious to know about uh, uh, what is this all pandemic all about, what is COVID and all. So I picked up a book uh, by, I'm sure you would have read that book uh, called uh, The Greatest Influenza of the World. You know, uh, it all talked, talked about uh, uh, the influenza, which Spanish flu, which struck us the way back in 1918, right? And over 100 million people died in, uh, in, in within, uh, I guess, uh, 12 months or something like that. That was a terrible lesson. And this, uh, James Perry wrote this back book uh, in the year 2004, I guess. It's a 526 page book. And I, I got to know a lot many things about the pandemic and the way it spreads and the kind of uh, uh, the way it rattles the whole world as such. It was a, a very, very monumental and authoritative, uh, uh, I would say, tale of morality. Disturbing tale of morality uh, of, uh, and what Jay Perry spoke about is that uh, the the strongest pand uh, weapon against pandemic is uh, nothing but truth, you know, and uh, uh, and then I guess uh, you know what he said that uh, is that uh, the the system has to remain truthful. People have to remain truthful to each other, and that is only when we can contain uh, the pandemic. And this is what he felt in 1918. The world did not follow. And I don't think there has been too much of a change uh, since then. Uh, we've all suffered from that, uh, <clears throat> this pandemic. In fact, uh, this session is being attended by uh, our former presidents uh, in the, the Palji also and uh, Ernest, Mr. Ernest also. So I would request uh, in the Pal, sir, to uh, uh, one of our former presidents to uh, say a few words, your comments on the uh, coverage of Dr. Munro and also your views and uh, on this talk. In the Palji. In the Palji is there. Uh, Ernest, sir. Uh, Ernest, Thank you. Ernest, yeah. Uh, can I? Can we have your views? <laughs> yes, certainly. Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Well, a very fascinating uh, talk. Uh, I, I was particularly uh, interested in the trends which uh, Professor Monroe uh, mm. gave us. And I thought that in, a, in our own country, uh, the role of our government, as, as with governments all over the world and how they responded to the pandemic, oh, yeah. there, has been, there has been a trend towards privatization of health, education. And these were just right. the type of uh, requirements when the pandemic struck. Uh, so government as such, uh, in terms of their organization, as you pointed out, is not very agile. Don't you think that there should be a national effort to bring, to change the organization and the way decisions are taken in the time of the pandemic, to bring in experts in various areas? So government has got to change its way of functioning to deal with this war. It's a warlike situation. And they've got to bring everyone together, NGOs, experts, to take decisions. Because they are taking serious decisions on lockdown and various uh, transport, education. Are they equipped to take these decisions in the way they are currently operating? Yeah, that, that's a really good comment. If you want me to make a comment on that. And I would yes. say um, they In other words, can we study how governments are operating? Uh, business can play a very limited role in this pandemic. Right. The government is taking yeah, is yeah. All, the, all the shots all over the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what happened in our country with respect to that was, uh, and you're even more fragmented than, than us in terms of the number of states that you have, but and different government bodies taking care of, of their constituencies. You know, we've got the provinces and territories and the, the, the major federal government 
put a lot of uh, financial support out there uh, and then allowed individual uh, provincial and territorial uh, governments to deal with it. But I think your, your, your point is really well taken is that this is a, a crisis situation that required a very different structure uh, and governance than the normal way we would govern. And we, never, we didn't adjust to that at all. We went through our traditional way of doing it. We, we brought in experts, uh, obviously health uh, experts talk to us every day uh, about what we need to do, but there wasn't that um, sort of collective centralized way of dealing with something that was uh, where we could have probably had a more uniform uh, way of dealing with this uh, across the country. And so because of that, it was more dis dispersed and diffused. You had uh, a number of disparities in terms of what one part of the country was experiencing versus other. And, uh, you know, some good and some bad, but there were, as I said, there were a lot of gaps that were identified in our systems uh, that were amplified or magnified during the pandemic. And the governments can't rectify those quick enough when they're in the middle of the pandemic. So um, your, your, your point is an interesting one. And I don't know whether the will is there in the part of the governments to say, um, when we're faced with a war-like situation, as I heard you correctly, a war-like situation uh, demands a different style of government than under normal circumstances. We yeah. didn't see that kind of a response from the government, right? It took quite a I think you're, you're, it took quite a I can't humidity for your country, but I would imagine, imagine with, yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, yeah. yeah. No. I, I like your idea. I like your idea. It'd be interesting to see the, as I said, the, the, the will. Uh, but you know, if, if you talk about them being more future ready, uh, that would be one of the ways that could be future ready is to put in a governance, a crisis governance structure. I remember when 9-11 happened. It's, it's, it's the advantage of being old, right? You can you have these situations that you can sort of, <laughs> you've lived through. Um, a lot of organizations post 9-11, uh, when they, how ready are we as an organization and what contingency plan do we have for uh, locking down if we had to lock down in a terrorist situation, okay? And we went through the protocols and preparing for that uh, post 9-11. So, uh, and then that sort of dissipated, right? I mean, that, sort of stabilized that uh, we won't talk about that anymore but uh, I think there's a similar type of lesson we could be all learning in here how do we going to be as, as an organization as a society or as a government or businesses or whatever 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 lens you want to use during a situation that is uh, as profound and impactful as the one we just and I say we haven't gone through we're still going through it right and we're, we're this not a situation yet, um, uh, but we're, we're, I'm hoping we're closer to the end than the beginning. So keep on talking about a fourth way. Mm -hmm. um, I think the introductory comments we're starting to get at, at this is, is um, um, you know, we hear this and respond to this uh, as individual is, is, uh, is being tasked. And I, I think, uh, some are, are, are to help those that are struggling with, with uh, being able to, to uh, work their way through this. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Dr. Munro. Uh, can you stop sharing the screen so that? Uh, yeah. Uh, that yeah. Can, that'll be better. Yeah, that's Is better. Is that better? Yes, much better. Much better. Okay. Uh, I have a lot of questions okay. from the attendees on the chat box, so I'm going to read out some of them, right? And uh, um, starting okay. with from Mr. Ajay Sharma, 
obviously everyone is saying it's a great presentation, very enlightening, uh, you know, what a beautiful, you know, way to present uh, this kind of situation as such. But the uh, question from Mr. Sharma is like, what should be the role of corporate in this pandemic so that they can retain their values and missions intact without hampering corporate governance issues? That's a question from Mr. Sharma. Oh, right. The You know, I, I, I talked about having a stronger sense of purpose, and I think there was a, a movement afoot prior to that. Uh, I, you know, obviously, they need to uh, adaptive culture, a resilient thing. Oh, they have a, um, a, a, a big responsibility to uh, be. Dr. Munro, your voice is breaking. As well, right? So some of these, is that, I'm sorry, my internet's. Yeah. Can, can, can you hear? Uh, no, no. Can't, you can't no, hear me. Really. Oh, okay. I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, now we can tell you what I can do. Now it's better. Now it's better. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll stop my break. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think, I think we're going to see, uh, Corporate sector help be a part of that because if we don't have that, we aren't going to be be. We are, we are losing your voice. Sir. Yeah. Must be by poor internet. Yeah, I know. You're coming and going off every now and then. You got disconnected also. In the meantime, we can inform. We will wait for Professor Mandro to rejoin. In the meantime, let me inform that on 23rd, in Friday Fundamentals, we have management lessons of Wari. A spiritual vakathon for centuries by Sri Vivek Paranspe. Do join us at five o'clock and listen to the experiences of Sri Vivek Paranspe about his Bari involvement. Mm -hmm. On 23rd. the 20th. 23rd. 23rd of On the 28th, we have. Uh, Celebrating Indian managers who Kavita made a Indian series. Kavita, ma'am, your voice is echoing. Can, can you hear me now? Yeah, we yes. can hear you, Dr. Mudo. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, you, you continue on. Huh. I think you were, you were announcing your upcoming events at the uh, Bombay Management Association, I believe. Yes, but now you are back, so I think mm -hmm. we can take it up. Well, you want me to repeat the, the question, Dr. Munro? Yeah, the only, the only uh, uh, sort of point I was trying to make with respect to the role of corporations is that they're going to be um, uh, relied upon or looked upon to play a more active role uh, in developing the, the requisite <laughs> ecosystem. <laughs> Okay. That's good. All good. All good. You can carry on, Dr. Munro. Yeah. So, so I, I, I think that's that the point I'm going to make is just that there, uh, I think you'll see a lot more collaboration with the uh, private public sectors working together on <clears throat> some of the efficiencies that exist out there. Um, I'm, 
I, I don't know about the privatization of a lot of the social we've had results with that so you know I, I think those be private or public uh, institutions see so so I'll, I'll leave oh dr Bruno, you're having a, we're having problems once again we're losing you every now and then. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I have my, my apologies. I apologize. Yeah. But maybe. <laughs> huh. I think we have a lot of questions, uh, Professor Munro. We can uh, actually mail you all those questions. Maybe you can have a look at it and then record, we can put them on our YouTube channel because the network is really testing us. Mm -hmm. Is that fine? Yes, yes. If, um, if people want to send some questions, I would gladly respond. To them. Yes. I know because yes. uh, okay. continu the continuity is not there, you know, the continuity and the clarity of- Yeah, no, no, I, pre I appreciate I, I appreciate that. So, so if people want to send in a question or have specific questions, I would gladly respond to, uh, to those if you'd like. Thank you so much. I, I, I could do that after the session, so. Yeah. Sure. So what do you, Kavita, ma'am? Yes, so we thank uh, uh, Professor Manro, the Dr. Verma. Hello. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Munro, for, as, as I like mentioned right in the beginning, it was an absolutely mind-boggling session. You know, the kind of coverage which you had uh, in your short presentation made us feel that uh, you've not left anything untouched in your, and uh, it did not just talk, talked about, uh, you know, what, what we faced, but also gave a lot of perspective for the future as such. And we all know that the, uh, <clears throat> The COVID-19 has uh, uh, brought the greatest recession since the World War II. And the way we suffered, you know, all know that almost like every part of the economy, every part of the world got rattled because of this COVID-19. And everything got impacted, as you all know that every area of life, from travel, to work, shop, everything, everything. Right. And uh, I, I'm, I'm really get, I get worried because what is really going to happen to the Gen Z, which is going to come, you know, uh, when they grow, because they will have a huge amount of issues because a lot of school kids uh, uh, are they not going to the school and there's a huge right. amount of for them to go back to the school. You know, so some, all these kids when they grow, you know, they reach the age of uh, uh, when they actually can contribute to the economy. I really don't know what is the kind of uh, uh, motivation they'll have or what will be the kind of creativity of these kids as such because they're seeing a different kind of world altogether as such. And then uh, we, we call them as a COVID era kid now. You know, and even uh, as I was speaking about the James Barry's book, is that the only weapon to treat COVID or any pandemic is by remaining true all the time as such. But unfortunately, that's not happening, and we don't really see uh, in 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 most of the parts of the economy or the countries or the politics and whatnot is happening. Uh, but then, uh, <clears throat> Homo sapiens have survived all kind of catastrophes right from uh, uh, the earthquakes to fire to whatnot from ages together and i'm sure we will survive this particular catastrophe also so thank you once again and uh, on behalf of uh, bombay management association our uh, president dr kavita and all past presidents ec members i sincerely thank you uh, <clears throat> for for a, a very enlightening talk and uh, you uh, you you would i'm sure you would have probably seen in the chat box also is that uh, this kind of uh, coverage we've really not seen in many presentations so far. So thank you once again. Uh, oh, good. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoy. I wish I was there in person that we could actually have a real conversation and, and not be subject to my poor internet connection. So, but I really do want to thank you for the opportunity to, to share what little I know about, about the, uh, the, 
go forward requirements for for all of us uh, in dealing with situations like like the COVID pandemic. And uh, I miss I miss being in India. It, it's got a special place in my heart, uh, having been there, uh, I don't know, maybe four or five times. So, um, and uh, I can only imagine the uh, magnitude of the challenge that you face as a, as a country in dealing with something like this, given the population and the circumstances that you're dealing with. And I want to wish everybody um, all the best going forward uh, through that. And as we get out of this and, and uh, we'll come out of this a stronger You'll come out of this a stronger country uh, and a stronger uh, uh, sense of individuals and, and community. And I want to wish you all the best on that. So thank you. Excellent. Thank, thank you. Excellent. Hoping to build back okay. better. Professor, okay. Mano, we also wish Canada and its citizens a safe and a wonderful future. We look forward to our greater friendship between our okay. two great countries of the Commonwealth. Yeah, thank you. And good luck on your thesis. Thank you so much. Good luck. I hope that in the future when the things go, uh, when we pass out of this uh, pandemic and your visit to India, we would definitely like to have in person for Bombay Management Association for further discussion. Thank you so much. Thank for you. Thank you very much. Invitation. Thank you. Care. Let me mention here that the... Uh, the BMA Masterclass, Friday Fundamentals, and Wednesday Webinars are available on Bombay Management Association YouTube channel. Please subscribe the YouTube channel of Bombay Management Association. And do join us for all the future programs, which we keep on posting on the social media, on our websites, and also in the WhatsApp groups. Uh, on 23rd, we are going to have the experience sharing of Sri Vivek Paranjpe on the spiritual walkathon for centuries, the management lessons in Wari. On 28th, we will be celebrating the Indian managers who made a difference. And do watch for the program because it's about Mr. P. L. Tandon, the first Indian uh, manager or CEO of Hindustan Unilever's Limited. Do join us on the Friday and the next Wednesday for Wednesday Wisdom Webinar and Friday Fundamentals. Thank you. Stay home. Stay safe. Subscribe to BMA YouTube channel. Get in touch for becoming the member of the Bombay Management Association. Thank you very much. Hoimi, can we have the uh, small video? Thank you. Good evening. Take good care of yourself and see you on Friday, the Friday Fundamentals. Thank you. Very nice video, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Congratulations.